Boom! We are live, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to the Nolan Hawkeye Anthony YouTube channel. And I thank all of you for being here, wherever you may be. And of course, however you may be listening. We will be continuing on the positional preview for the Iowa Hawkeyes going into the 2023-24 football season. And the position group that I will be previewing today is, of course, the quarterbacks. Now, just a heads up, I will do my best to do all of the positional uh, previews. Now, I'm really not super concerned about it because there's about 100 different positional previews that uh, that you guys can check out as Iowa fans. Um, and at the end of the day, personally, I'm far more concerned with the actual game results and responding to what we have seen on the field. Uh, but I will do my best to get and do as many of the position groups before the season starts. And without further ado, let's get into this. By the way, if you guys are not subscribed, be sure to hit that subscribe button. I'm trying to get to 2,000 subs by the time the season starts. I thank all of you who have already hit that subscribe button. The channel has grown way bigger than I even expected it to. And I am just very grateful to all of you guys. There have been some just truly amazing comments and and uh, supportive comments that I have seen in the past year, year and a half. Uh, so I want to thank you for that like comment uh, and all of that good stuff. So the big storyline with the quarterback position is, of course, the transfer portal and what Iowa did this past offseason. Now, when you talk about the quarterbacks, you really have to kind of go at it in a variety of ways. And what I mean by that is in Iowa City, and I would say fans at large, there is this kind of where do we place the blame when it comes to the lack of offensive production when it comes to the Iowa Hawkeyes? I think there are those who think it's the weapons that Iowa has, meaning the running backs, the uh, wide receivers, and the tight ends. Uh, although I would say that that's probably not as much, but there are certainly fans who think it's that position group or area. And then there are those who blame it solely on the quarterback, and that is that. And then there are those, of course, who blame offensive coordinator Brian Ferentz. Now, I think the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. I think at times Iowa has been decimated by injuries and uh, various things that has played a role, a, a big role in Iowa not being able to get the flow that they look that they're looking for on offense. But in the last two positional previews that I did for the wide receivers and the running backs, I showed you guys that Iowa has recruited about as well as you could as, as a team with Iowa's offensive production that they could recruit. In fact, I would say they're recruiting even better than what their offensive output is. Uh, I mean, we're talking several four stars that they've landed high three-star guys with multiple regional offers. Uh, and I think a lot of Iowa fans believe that when it comes to Iowa's weapons, they're only able to get guys who are like diamonds in the rough uh, from you know, the Mac or, or, uh, you know, have Mac offers and mid-major offers. And while that's some of them, it's not all of them. Iowa has definitely landed a lot of talent. So that's where we start is in, in that place. Now, Iowa bet on it, not being Brian Ferentz, that Brian Ferentz was not the issue that the issue rather was the quarterback. And I do think that there is some truth to that. Uh, Spencer Petrus is, for all intents and purposes, Spencer Petrus was a quarterback that you would expect to see in the 1970s, the 1980s, maybe even the 1990s, but that's about it. I mean, you know, really when you think about it, the kind of pro-style quarterback was a thing all the way up through the 2000s. I mean, really the mobile quarterback hasn't, turned into the thing that it's turned into until I would say about the two ten, 2010s. And Iowa was very limited because of Spencer Petrus's lack of mobility. I said countless times that when you are a quarterback like Spencer Petrus, where 
you have a lack of mobility. You need two, a, a few things to make you into a success or, or help you be a successful quarterback. And those are protection up front. Every quarterback can use that. A good running game, which is part of offensive line play. And as a quarterback, having a mind like Tom Brady, like a Peyton Manning, and really being able to see the, the game very quickly in your mind to make up for your lack of athleticism, which Spencer Petrus, he was the signal call caller at Iowa multiple years as a starter. He had all the game experience, and we did not see the growth. Ultimately, we did not see the growth that you would think would happen with a quarterback that has seen game action many, many, many times over. So Iowa bet on it not being Brian Ferentz. And they went out and used a tremendous amount of transfer portal resources to get one Cade McNamara. Now, this was absolutely a massive get. I'm sure Cade McNamara had tons of suitors, uh, although Iowa did land him fairly quickly. I'm going to pull up his, uh, st his team or his... Uh, statistics here so that we can see what Iowa is working with. He's six foot one, 205 pounds. He's from Reno, Nevada. Um, I, I lived in Reno when I was a little younger. I'm, I'm definitely well acquainted with Reno and here are his stats in 2020. He completed 43 passes out of 71, 60.6% completion percentage, 425 yards, five TDs, zero INTs with a quarterback rating of a 134.1 average yards per attempt. I believe is what that would be was six in 2021, 210 completions, 64.2% completion percentage, 2,576 passing yards, averaging almost eight yards per attempt. 15 passing touchdowns and six INTs with a quarterback rating of a 141.9. And then in 2022, uh, uh, Michigan, of course, had five-star quarterback J.J. McCarthy coming in, uh, and there was just a tremendous pressure for the Michigan Wolverines uh, to have J.J. McCarthy supplant Cade McNamara as the starting quarterback and Cade McNamara basically had one shot he had one game uh the Michigan Wolverines won but Cade McNamara did not have the best game and he was no longer the starting quarterback for Michigan now of course he ended up getting injured uh and uh the rest is history and now he is with the Iowa Hawkeyes he has two years of eligibility left due to the uh the COVID pandemic uh, extra year of eligibility. Uh, those were his stats last year, 14 of 25, uh, basically just one game of production, one tub, one tub, uh, to one INT. So what, before I get into my expectations and my thoughts on Cade McNamara, which is primarily what this video is going to be about, uh, let's go ahead and look at what he was as a recruit. So you guys can see what, um, Iowa is getting. Uh, he was a four-star recruit, according to 247 Sports, and the number eighth ranked, I believe, probably dual threat quarterback, if I had to guess. ESPN had him graded as an 81, and Rivals had him graded as a 5.8 four-star. All three recruiting services has had him graded as a four-star. He had offers from Alabama. I mean, he had offers from nearly every school that you can think of. And of course, there's the story that Cade McNamara was the number one quarterback on the Alabama Crimson Tide recruiting board. So take that for <laughs> take that for what you will. Uh, I think it's a cool little story. I don't know the truth to it or, or how much truth is uh, there is to it. Now, moving along here, before we get into the expectations for Cade McNamara, which is is really the vo the focal point of this video. Iowa brought in Marco, uh, 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 quarterback out of the Hun school. He was the one quarterback that Iowa took out of high school, Marco Lainez. And as I said in his recruiting video, really, 
he was highly, highly rated and touted early on in the recruiting process. But because he committed to Iowa so early on and stopped going to a lot of these recruiting camps and showcases, he really dropped in the recruiting rankings. And you do see this happening quite often with the recruiting services, which is why you have to take recruiting services with a grain of salt, because there are guys like Marco Lainez who commit to schools early on and don't go to these showcases. And so it's kind of, you know, a situation where out of sight, out of mind, and they end up dropping. So at one time, Marco Lainez was actually considered a four-star quarterback by 247 Sports and Rivals.com. Um, ESPN had him as a 79. He ended up being an 86 by on three, 86 by 247 Sports, and a 5.6 by Rivals. I actually, one second, guys. I actually really think Marco Lainez is a great fit for the Iowa Hawkeyes, and I have a ton of optimism for him. I'm not going to spend too much time on him, but suffice it to say, he has had extensive training with a really, really good quarterback coach in Tony Rossiapi, um, and he comes from a great high school in the Hun School. He's played phenomenal competition. Uh, he is very athletic. He's definitely a mobile quarterback. Um he, I wouldn't say he's a run first quarterback, but he definitely can run the football. It is obvious. It is painfully obvious that Iowa has made a concerted effort in the last year and a half. If you look at Marco Lainez, you look at their uh, quarterback commit in the 2024 recruiting class in James Razor and what Iowa got in the uh, uh, transfer portal that Iowa has fully bought in to the idea of having a quarterback that can be, th that can have some mobility. And I don't see why not, because if you think back to the quarterbacks that have had success at Iowa, CJ Beathard, Jake Rudak had some success at Iowa and certainly had success at Michigan. Uh, Ricky Stanzi, Brad Banks, all of these, Drew Tate, all of these quarterbacks had mobility, but Iowa, like randomly, all of a sudden became this school that was just known for getting these six foot five, you know, uh, uh, stick in the, you know, uh, boot in the dirt or boot in the mud quarterbacks that, that just stand back there like a statue. And really that's, that's just not the case. I mean, Iowa has at different times recruited mobile quarterbacks, but they definitely, um, with, uh, with, uh, Greg Davis and definitely early on in, in, uh, Brian Ferentz's tenure definitely went more towards, uh, uh, pocket passing quarterbacks. The next guy on this list is Deacon Hill. Um, he is out of Santa Barbara, beautiful place. I highly recommend all of you visiting if you can. Uh, he committed to Wisconsin and after the coaching change decided to get in the transfer portal. Now what's interesting about him is he was actually committed to play at a, I believe either like a one, a, uh, 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 FCS division one school it may even been division two, but originally he was, uh, committed to a much smaller school. And once Iowa Fordham, there it is. Once Iowa came knocking, he absolutely took the opportunity and chose the Iowa Hawkeyes. Guys, he is his recruiting rankings are on par with Cade McNamara. Uh, on three actually has him rated higher than any of the recruiting services have Cade McNamara ranked. He had a 92 grade on on three. He had a grade of a 90 for 247 sports. Uh, uh 5.7 high three star by rivals and a mid three star quarterback by ESPN. So, you know, it was definitely not as much of a consensus as um with ESPN's grade as uh Cade McNamara, but this guy definitely had some top tier schools after him. I mean, Wisconsin, UCLA, Kansas State. Um, you know, this this is a nice I think that this is actually a very, very low-key, excellent get for the Iowa Hawkeyes. 
because he went to Wisconsin and did not immediately see the field, he didn't have as many suitors as some of these other quarterbacks would have. And, but the talent is all still there. And we've heard some good things out of camp. Um, Kirk Ferentz said after the first fall camp that if it, if the season were to start today, that he would be the number two quarterback ahead of Joey Labus, Joe Labus. Now, of course, Joe Labus was number two on the depth chart when it was released pre-spring. Um, and that, of course, after the kids day, we saw that that is all uh, not true, uh, which is why I always say take the Take the depth chart that Kirk Ferentz releases with a grain of salt, okay? Because he does not care a ton about it. Uh, Deacon Hill is the, in my eyes, based on what we have heard from Kirk Ferentz's mouth, Deacon Hill is the undisputed number two quarterback on the Iowa Hawkeyes roster. If Cade McNamara went down, Deacon Hill would be the quarterback that came in for the Iowa Hawkeyes. And lastly, Joe Labus. Uh, I am very high on Joe Labus. I liked what we saw in his game against Kentucky. I thought that it showed that he absolutely can play at that level. He has excellent size. Uh, he has mobility. He's very athletic. He has uh, good arm strength. He was highly under-recruited in high school. He probably would have been a, 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 a consensus four-star recruited by all the Big Ten schools had it not been a COVID year. Let me see if I can get his recruiting profile pulled up. But this year he's dealing with injuries. And the bottom line is, folks, that the Division I level is, is very cutthroat. It's very cutthroat. And if a school has the ability, especially in the day and age of the transfer portal, when coaches cannot count on players to remain loyal to their school, they are going to upgrade at that position, if they can, if they have the opportunity, they will do that. And they absolutely did that with Deacon Hill and Cade McNamara. I mean, really, guys, you look at uh, post Kentucky, it was almost certain that Joe Labus would be the starting quarterback for the Iowa Hawkeyes. Here it is. So Joey Labus was considered a four-star by 247 Sports, as you guys can see here, a 74 by ESPN, and a 5.6 uh, by Rivals. Lastly, who did Iowa lose? Iowa lost uh, Carson May out of the 2022 recruiting class. I actually really liked Carson May. I thought he was an excellent prospect, but ultimately he didn't like his time at Iowa. He didn't see a path uh, towards playing time and decided to transfer. He is now at Wyoming. All right, guys, let's go ahead and wrap this video up and let's talk about Cade McNamara and my expectations. I believe that Cade McNamara will make all the difference for the Iowa Hawkeyes. I, as I said at the beginning of this video, ultimately, I think the answer of, of who is the most to blame, Brian Ferentz, the quarterback, uh, the offensive line, whatever, I think it's it's somewhere in the middle. I think Brian Ferentz definitely has a part to blame in uh in all of this. But I also think that they were not they did not really have a quarterback that fit what they needed to do. So I'm going to be playing some of the Cade McNamara highlights in the background with no sound obviously. Um the the answer is somewhere in the middle. Of, of who is most to blame. Do I think that uh, Brian Ferentz is a perfect offensive coordinator? No, I don't. I think he's a good football coach, but I don't think he is, that his future is at the offensive coordinator position. I just don't. Now, Cade McNamara is going to come in and kind of uh, put, put, fill up these holes and kind of provide cover for Brian Ferentz. That is what's going to happen. Now, don't expect Cade McNamara to have a 3,000-yard passing season or anything like that. I think the mark for Cade McNamara in having a successful season should be about 2,500 passing yards. And I would say anywhere between 13 and 20 passing touchdowns. If he can have that type of season, it will be a staunch upgrade from what we have seen 
out of Spencer Petras over the last couple of years. Uh, I would love it if Cade McNamara was able to get over the 20 touchdown mark and be in the, you know, somewhere like the 2,800 passing yards range. But I think it's likely that he'll have a similar season than what we saw from him at Michigan in 2021. Um, Cade McNamara is an excellent leader. I think that uh, when I look at the Big Ten West, while Wisconsin may have the most talented quarterback in in the SMU transfer, I think Cade McNamara is right next to him. He has a lot of talent himself, but ultimately who the best quarterback is, leadership and all of these intangibles that you take into account, it's Cade McNamara. Iowa has the best quarterback in the Big Ten West, and I would say they have a top five quarterback in the Big Ten at large, which is a staunch improvement from what we saw in Spencer Petras. Again, where every year he was in the bottom third of Big Ten quarterbacks. So uh, I am expecting a very solid season out of Cade McNamara. Now, I made a Facebook post about this, and I do want to say this before I close out the video, that one thing that is concerning about Cade McNamara is that he seems, especially over these last two years, he seems to be injury prone. And it's not really surprising because he is a smaller quarterback at 6'1". this is going to make it to where the Iowa offensive, it's going to add even more pressure to the Iowa offensive line to keep him upright because it is so important that he remains healthy over this court, over the course of the season. Um, He got slightly, we saw him injured in the fall practice and we saw him get injured early on. Now it was a slight injury, but it was an injury that took him out of the contest. Nonetheless, at the kids day camp. And to me, that is concerning because a guy who is injury prone, and I saw this when I played Division One water polo, and, and I've seen it all my life in athletics, whether watching it or playing it, a guy who is injury prone always has these constant like little injuries and eventually a big injury. And, you know, I, I hope, and I'm knocking on wood, that it does not become a bigger thing than what it is right now. Uh, And I I really hope that this just ends up being a theory for me or a hypothesis or or, or not even that. Merely, I hope that this just remains an observation. Um, And, you know, ultimately, if Iowa's offensive line can do what it's supposed to do and keep him upright, I think it should be okay. But folks, I would not expect Cade McNamara. And it's not because he's like weak or not strong or anything like that. He's very tough. He's a very tough guy. He's a tough cat, but ultimately he is a, a smaller quarterback. Um, and you know, anything is possible, uh, especially in big 10 action. I just don't want you guys to expect Cade McNamara to be a Nate Stanley who stood six foot five, six foot six back there in the pocket. Cade McNamara is as tall as I am six, one, six, two. Okay. Um, so Uh, That is definitely something to watch out for. So again, a successful season for Cade McNamara would be at the very least 2,500 passing yards. And I would say anywhere between 13 and 18 passing touchdowns. Every, anything above 18, you know, if he could get in the, in the low twenties, hell, if he could even get in the mid twenties, I certainly would not expect that as we have not seen that. Uh, in a long, I mean, there's been very few quarterbacks who have done that. It's Nate Stanley, I think, was really an anomaly. Now, by the way, guys, that happened under Brian Ferentz. Don't forget that that Nate Stanley had, uh, you know, it. That's just me being an internally optimistic guy. That I think back to the one or two years where there was some decent offensive numbers from Brian Ferentz and say, well, see, look back then. Um, I think a much more realistic and. Uh, a much more realistic, good season by Cade Matt or a successful season would be 13 to 18 passing touchdowns compared to like, you know, uh, you know, anything below seven interceptions. If he can keep it below seven interceptions and have somewhere between 13 and 18 passing touchdowns, that will be a successful campaign. Uh, Lastly, the other quarterbacks. Uh, Deacon Hill, as I said, is the number two quarterback 
uh, for the Iowa Hawkeyes. I think it's good that Iowa knows that they have a quarterback in Joe Labus that is, if, if he's healthy, which he is not right now, if he is healthy, um, that he can play and, and lead Iowa to victory as he did against a SC, SEC opponent in the Kentucky Wildcats. But again, he's injured and we'll see what happens with that. I think Iowa, I think Deacon Hill is a, a is a solid number two option. Um, I, this is kind of just forecasting way, way ahead. You know, while I'm happy, Iowa has Deacon Hill. And ultimately, if Joe Labus cannot beat out Deacon Hill, then he likely wouldn't have made it in the Big Ten regardless. You know, this always happens with Iowa that I, especially at the quarterback position, some of these other positions where various things happen and Iowa ends up losing a really good prospect that they can't see it all the way through with. And I, I do believe Joe Labus is a very good prospect. I think he has all the physical tools to be a successful quarterback in the Big Ten and for the Iowa Hawkeyes. But to only time will tell with all of that. All right, guys, like, comment, share, subscribe. Help your boy get to 2,000 subs. I thank all of you for your support. If you guys want to donate to the channel, you absolutely can via cash app in the description or PayPal. Uh, and last but not least, DBAP, don't be a pussy willow and facts or feelings because your feelings just don't matter. Love you guys. See you great Hawk fans next time. Bye.